Hey guys, what's going on? Tyler Hansman here with Tyler Hansman Performance. So today we're going to discuss specific positions within the pitching delivery that lead to a high velocity delivery. So kind of the first step to this is we're going to give a simple definition of pitching mechanics. So pitching mechanics is basically how these positions fit together rhythmically to create a pitcher's unique delivery and abilities. Right? So within this, there's five distinct checkpoints that we can kind of use to compare uh, the efficiency of mechanics between individual athletes. Right? So we have peak leg lift, so basically the point at which your knee is at its highest before it begins its descent. Right? We have lead foot contact, so when that foot strikes the ground. So not just when we make some contact, but when we actually bear weight. So in a slow motion video, you'll be able to see the uh, ankle stiffen up a little bit there. All right, so from that point, we have maximum layback. So when your arm is as far back as it'll be, all right, that forearm is as close to parallel on the ground as it's gonna get. From there, we have ball release. So when the ball leaves your hand, and then we also have maximum internal rotation. All right, so these are kind of the, the distinct positions we're gonna be talking about today, and we'll get a little bit more in depth here. Okay, so let's talk about the peak leg lift. So this is gonna be the point that kind of sets up the tone for the rest of the delivery. So what I mean by that is good movement here doesn't necessarily mean that we're gonna have a great delivery going forward, but it does set us up with a good opportunity to have a good delivery, right? Whereas bad movement here kind of sets the tone for the delivery, may get us off timing wise, and may kind of make some mistakes that the rest of our body has to make up for, right? And we know that pitching mechanics are very synchronized. So we not only need these positions to happen, we also need the rhythm between these things to happen. So if the positions are bad, the rhythm is probably going to be bad to go along. And that, the rhythm is something we're going to discuss in part two of this series, but just know that that's an issue. So, what does a good uh, peak leg lift position look like? Well, we're looking for some kind of center of mass shift. So we're looking for that belly button to be forward of the back leg or the rubber. We don't want to be staying over the rubber in kind of this balance point position that old school pitching coaches will preach, because what happens if we do that is we don't shift the force vector at all. Right? So we want some horizontal force happening, not just vertical force. Okay? Vertical force is still going to be present right? because we're in contact with the ground, but we want to shift that so we're also getting some force this way. Okay? If that doesn't happen, what we're going to do is we're going to end up probably pushing or kind of like jumping off the mound, triple extending, and then we're going to lock out this back piece. We're not going to be able to effectively segment hip internal rotation and upper torso rotation. That's going to affect our hip shoulder separation, which we're going to talk about a little bit more in the next position. Okay? The other piece to this is that center of mass shift works in a similar way to a depth jump. Right? So when you step off a box, if we time it up correctly between this and we're strong enough, we time up the stretch reflex and that concentric muscle action, what's going to happen is we're going to act like kind of like a trampoline and we're going to get that trampoline effect where those two things amplify each other. It's the same with the center of mass shift. Okay? Not only are we already getting our weight going forward, but then when we actually do push from that back leg and internally rotate, we're going to get an amplification of that force. Okay? Okay, so the next position to talk about is lead foot contact. Okay? So that's when this front leg is going to start to bear weight, right? So it's not just when it lightly touches the ground, but starts to bear some weight. You see that ankle stiffen up. That's lead foot contact. So, what are we looking for from this position? Okay, so we're looking for some degree of knee flexion, right? But not a crazy amount. Okay, so we still ideally will have that knee slightly behind your ankle, all right? So we're keeping that weight back a little bit. We don't want to activate that stumble reflex and just kind of fall over passively over that front leg. The next piece is we're looking for that arm to be flipped up somewhere between 45 and 90 degrees. So we don't want to be down here, but we don't want to already be early in the external rotation, okay? We want to be somewhere in between those, all right? After that, we're also looking for some degree of hip shoulder separation. The amount is going to vary from person to person based on individual factors such as the mobility of the hip internal rotators, thoracic spine, rotation mobility to the arm side, right, and some length tension factors that will vary individual to individual based on their, their differences in their muscle fibers. So the next piece we're looking for from there is the degree of horizontal abduction, right, so this kind of like scap retraction movement here, the horizontal abduction of the shoulder, the degree that we have there. Okay? So all of these are things that we're looking for with these positions to kind of see whether it's a high or low velocity delivery or our best guess in terms of this because right now we're just talking about positions. Okay? So all other things being equal, more hip shoulder separation, right? assuming you have the ability to get out of that position, 
is likely to lead to uh, higher caloric loss. The next piece is greater horizontal adduction, same deal because we know that horizontal adduction velocity has a, has a role to play in throwing velocity. So the more we have here, the greater pre-stretch we have, so the higher concentric force we're going to get from that pack. The next thing is, we want that arm to be somewhere between 45 and 90 degrees. So it flips up way late, so we're down here at foot strike. What's going to happen is then we're either not going to be able to get to the position that we want to be in, and you'll see that kind of in the next piece with layback, or we're going to get there, but bone is very sensitive to the rate of loading, right? So what that can mean is trouble with the medial elbow, anterior shoulder, other things like that. Obviously, this doesn't mean that you'll definitely get hurt. It just may mean that your risk may be slightly higher. So we want to avoid those things if possible, okay? The next piece is that lead leg, right? So if we get too far forward into flexion, or we're starting to see continued flexion after this point, we probably have a problem there because we're going to see the stumble reflex activate rather than being able to stay behind this leg to some degree and then vault over it further on in the delivery. Okay, so the next position is maximum layback. So when that forearm gets as close to parallel to the ground it's going to get, that's max layback. Right, so I'm calling it max layback rather than max external rotation because it's really the combination of three things. So we have thoracic spine extension, right? We have uh, scapular posterior tilt, so that scapula is kind of tilting back like it would on like a lift off from the wall, and then we have true glenohumeral external rotation. So those three things work together to get us as far back as we can. So high velocity throwers are going to be closer in general to about 180 degrees, and low velocity throwers are going to be closer to like 160 or 165. So, this kind of goes with the idea of we're basically trying to get as much distance as possible over which we can apply force to the baseball. So, obviously, greater external rotation helps with that. The other piece is the farther back we get, the greater pre stretch we get on the internal rotator, which is the more powerful internal rotation is going to be when we get into that acceleration phase next. Okay, so the next position is ball release. So this is, when, this is the point where the ball is actually going to leave your hand. So what we're looking for here is as extended of a front knee as we can get. Again, this will be kind of different between people based on individual factors such as hamstrings length and that kind of thing. Um, as well as some other mechanical factors that, that can probably be improved. Uh, but we're looking for some degree of close to full knee extension. All right? The greater flexion we're seeing, the more likely it is there's a problem with that. Okay? The next piece is we're looking for forward flexion in the upper body. Okay? So that doesn't mean we have to be crazy rolled forward, but we are going to be going with the, the Paul Nyman idea of bow flexed bow. Right? So we're looking for uh, basically starting here, getting here, and then getting here again. So we're basically like going from multiple positions of stretched and flexed. Okay? So that's kind of what we're looking for here. So we want to basically get from this extended position at foot strike to this flexed position at ball release. Okay? The next piece we're looking for is late launch. So basically what that means is releasing the ball past the line of the shoulders. Okay? So that's an effect of two things. The forward flexion that we talked about and shoulder rotation. Okay? So this kind of goes along with the idea of applying force to the baseball over as great of an arc of motion as possible. Right? So if we're not seeing the ball released out in front of the body, or we're seeing a more upright delivery, or we're seeing a very, very flexed knee, those may be all things that we need to examine. Okay, so the last position that we're looking for is max internal rotation. So basically, after the ball has been released, we're starting to decelerate the arm, and we see something along these lines. All right, so we're looking for some degree of elbow bend, we're looking for some degree of pronation, and we're looking for uh, kind of like that anterior tilt of the scapula along with what a humeral internal rotation, right? So all of these things are going to help to decelerate the arm and take some stress off of the passive restraints, right? Such as the UCL, uh, the biceps tendon, we'd like to be a little bit more, more passive restraint than it is. We don't want to be using that a crazy amount like you sometimes see in more amateur type throwers. Um, and we're looking for some degree of pronation. The pronation is going to vary from athlete to athlete. Um, you may not see crazy pronation in all guys. Uh, as long as we're getting some kind of co-contraction around the elbow, we're probably good because what we're looking for are those active restraints, the muscles in this case, to take 
the load off of the passive restraints, in this case, the UCL. So as long as we're not seeing a supinated finish, we're probably okay. And as long as we're seeing some degree of elbow bend, or we're not getting that elbow locking out, and we're getting tons of stress on the biceps tendon and the anterior shoulder, um, then we're probably good. So that's what we're looking for out of the maximum internal rotation. Okay, so what's needed to get into all of these high level positions? Well, so there's a mix of mobility, patterning, strength, all kinds of different factors uh, that are kind of gone over in more in depth in the article. So you have to refer back to that in order to get all that information in order to kind of help yourself better pattern these elite positions. All right, so stay tuned for section two of this article series where we talk about rhythm and how that fits together with these positions.